All right, a couple questions. Number one, who here has played an MMO, massive multiplayer online game? World of Warcraft counts. All right, sweet. So uh, I spend, oh, we'll get to that in a moment. We're going to talk about how to build, launch, and run a massive multiplayer online game in four years. Then I'll leave you for a while. So who is this tattered guy in the jeans standing in front of you? Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Heavy Cloud, we're a local company. Before that, I was the director of operations at Electronic Arts, Electronic Arts Mythic. Over there, I saw the, oversaw the network architecture, system administration, DevOps engineering, central engineering. I'm also just a general computer nerd. Some of the games I've worked on, to give you an idea, uh, these are all games I do to maintain, launch, and develop on. So it, it's a good breadth of different games, but all of them are massive multiplayer online games. So the plan for tonight, we're going to talk about these things. First, we're going to talk about where we were with MMOs five years ago, where we are today. Uh, and with all things, we'll see how plans go. Second part of this, by the way, I'm severely dyslexic. So if you guys see anything up here as yourself, keep your comments to yourself. <laughs> All right, so MMO, launching an MMO has a couple of requirements. At least it did back in the day. <laughs> Support 3,500 PCU per shard. We're going to talk about two key words you're going to see, PCU and shard. PCU means peak concurrent user. It means number of people who are playing at that very second on a particular set of servers. A shard is a cluster of servers. So if you're playing World of Warcraft and you go and sign on to your server, that is what we consider a shard. Uh, we need to provide 24 7 support. You guys can read this. The important things to call out, you will support 420,000 people playing your game at the same time. This is not 420,000 people going to your website and hitting it at the moment. This is 420,000 people sustained connection to your game, constantly playing for hours and sometimes, apparently, days and months. Like, has anybody ever heard of poop sock? <laughs> we'll talk about that. Never mind. All right, so uh, important part, again, 15 kilobits per second for a player, sustained. Um, and then from a disk standpoint, we'll talk about that in a moment, 20K to 40K character record. When you create a character in a game, we've got to store that on disk somewhere. Usually it comes between 20 and 40K, unless you're in the case of some of the other games where it's like 8 megs per player. Don't do that. Bad idea. So uh, we're gonna, we are going to plan out a game here called Statfest. The game does not actually exist. It is based off of the games that I've worked on in some fashion, but mostly from my experience. When you go when you build an MO, you have to have a set of processes both on a shard and central processes. Your central processes are things like your account manager, your login processes, things that everybody is going to hit. When you actually switch over to the server, when you select your character and play with all of your friends, you have all these processes that are on your shard. So you have your world, and you have your connection aggregator, which we call the lobby, and so on and so forth. Things like your mail manager, being able to mail people in game, and that kind of stuff. It's all sort of siloed into one shard. Oddly enough, this sort of matches up nicely with the silo concept of DevOps versus not DevOps. So this gives you an idea of the process you're going to run. This is the architecture you will see in, a, in an MMO like this. This is your general process layout and architecture across an environment. This is usually run across a thousand servers worldwide in multiple data centers when we run this particular architecture. Um, the important thing to note is this. Here's your shard. This is the processes you run here that are going to maintain just 3,500 people. And these are the processes that need to be able to sustain 45 450,000 people. The difference is there's not a lot of complex stuff going on here. This is pretty straightforward stuff. Authentication management, uh, you know, this is a little intense, but it's mostly just patching the client, letting people log in, customer service stuff. It's not thing that is, things that are really hard to scale in general. Over here, we're talking about things that are really, really hard to scale, especially this process here. This is the world process. That's where you're actually in the game, where the game logic actually lives. When you log into the game, you hit the lobby, you select your character, and then it kicks you to whatever world you were last in. If you're a new character, you go to whatever the first region you need to be in is. That's inside of the world process. These processes typically, in this particular instance, only hold anywhere between 450 and 1,000 players at any time. So there's multiple world processes that make up an entire game. If you were going to be in one of those worlds, you might see 300 people, you might see 1,000, but I had never seen a world process at least four years ago for more than 1,000 people at one time. I should note all these processes are most of them, most of these, all written in C. They are single threaded. We didn't do threading because threading is really hard. And so there was no, we wanted speed and we wanted to keep it simple. So, hence the single threaded process. So, what's missing from Stabfest, that whole architecture? Well, we didn't talk about panic crossing. We didn't talk about security systems. We didn't talk about networking equipment. That was not my data center. Uh, we didn't talk about any of that stuff. We didn't talk about administration systems. We didn't talk about metric systems. So, that was just to run the game systems themselves. As you can imagine, the environment is actually quite a bit larger than that when you actually put it into play. 
So what did we learn after five years ago when we launched that Taylor MMO? Well, we first we figured out that people didn't want shards anymore. We were at a point in technology where shards should not necessarily be a thing. There's a game called EVE Online that technically runs shardless, and everybody can move around and play with anybody. And that's what people wanted. If anybody knows who that guy that Monkey fought Island. Rant for, say what? Uh-huh, uh-huh. That cheaply. That's yes. nice. Uh, servers, data center, bandwidth, too expensive. I mean, when we launched one of my games, we spent $25 million on hardware. And that was before we even had a single paying customer. So if you have any idea, that's, that's really buying the farm before you actually have any cows. We'll get to that analogy later. Uh, people want more social. And then this is a big change in the game industry. Free to play versus subscription. If the games I ran before was $15 a month. We could have a pay model that made sense. Now, all of you come play a game, and none of us, none of us pay anything. So now that $25 million that I spent in hardware is not actually going to make me any money at all. So we're going to go on to the next iteration of this game. This would be what we consider an MMO looking today, or at least in the last year or two. Um, Stat Best Online 2. We will note a huge difference. We have moved almost all of our processes to central. And the reason is because we can't have shards anymore. We can't silo things. People need to be able to move around with all their friends whenever they want and not have to like log in, log out, create new characters. People are done with that, they don't want anymore. They think that we can handle it. So now we just have these processes for our world and our lobby, two things that I mentioned earlier. These are going to be shared across the entire environment now. So you're going to have thousands of them, but they're going to need to be able to talk to each other. And then furthermore, that all of these are going to be able to talk to all of those simultaneously. So this becomes really, really complicated. And it, it, it's very clear how much more complicated it becomes when you start to try and make this completely distributed. Every single process has to be able to talk to every single other process. Now, some of you, has anybody here used like an active queuing message protocol, like a centralized message router like that? Yes, sir. Okay, so general premise, you have a bunch of networking pieces. You put one piece in the center, you talk to it, it routes messages. Or say router. It's fantastic. It's a brilliant thing. And in fact, when we started on the last game that I was working on, that was actually what we started doing. The problem is, by default, it is a long one. That is, that is what it does. Now, you can build clustering so that it sort of handles that. But then you start to ask your question, am I building something more complex to solve the problem, and is it going to break? And possibly, maybe, maybe not. In our case, what we decided to do was actually write something called like a directory server, where a process would start up and ask for the IPs and addresses and ports of all the stuff it needed to talk to, and it would connect directly to it, thus eliminating any need for a bottleneck. A little bit more complicated than the network library, but in the long run, fantastic for the game. It means we can scale well beyond that central piece that we were going to have before. Again, same basic premise. You have all of these processes, your central processes, but these are now all distributed. These are all now distributed. The whole environment supports 450,000 people playing at the exact same time. Uh, it took us a long time to get to this piece, and there's a couple of things to call out. One, we are using both NoSQL and SQL databases. And we'll talk about this in our slide, but there's no reason to choose. They both do things very, very well. It just matters of what you're going to be using them for. In our case, and this is what a character record does, the thing I mentioned earlier, the, the basically 20 to 40k character records, we need to be able to save these out no matter where you were in the world. So if you logged in and collected a piece of gold, we need to save it. We need to know that's what happened. So what we ended up doing is setting metrics, basically thresholds. If you leveled your character up, we would save you immediately. If not, we'd put you in the memory here. But the problem was is that we didn't need something to go right incredibly fast, which at the time was not something that most of the internet was focused on. They were focusing on read systems. How fast can people read? How fast can we get the data out? How fast can we get the data in was our problem. So we ended up writing our own thing four years ago when we started on this to go bad boy. Uh, by the time we got done with it, what I wrote was completely obsolete, and we went with something else entirely. So <laughs> <laughs> but it was an OSQL solution nonetheless. So, in the course, uh, database mechanism here, this is indexable data. We need to be able to look up things about your mail, about what auctions you run. We need to index that data. Whereas over here, we don't really care. We just want to load your block of data off disk, and we put, want to put it in memory, and we want to work with it. Yep. What do you say that going with for your LC4? What product? For the facetious, facetious product? Like, not real product? The, the, the real product. The real product? Uh, can't tell you. But I can tell you that uh, there are lots of fantastic options on here, and there may or may not be a hint of what it is later. Maybe? No, I can't talk about the tech that's on the game. It just got released. Or else I'll even go. And I don't even work there anymore, so I guess I don't care. But whatever. So, the, all right. So, anyways, there was a big part of all of that that I mentioned earlier. Data centers were really expensive. We spent a lot of money on data center costs racks, power, bandwidth. And you couldn't just get into those contracts and then get out. That wasn't going to happen. 
So the idea was move to the cloud. Of course, the initial reaction to this is it's cheaper. Not always true, it turns out. <laughs> um, so the challenge is the cloud right off the bat. By the way, I should tell you that I'm the CEO of a cloud company, uh, but we're going to go over pros and cons anyways. So the systems are not powerful. It's totally different than they assemble. It used to be that you have a blade, and the blade was going to behave exactly like this, and it was going to do this exactly the same, and your development environment is with your live environment, and you could engineer to those premises. Inside of the cloud, not, not so much. You can spin up a server on the East Coast, and you're going to get like a processor from 2010 that has 20 megs of on, uh, on CPU cache, and you go over to the West Coast, and you spin it up, and it's like 2008s, and have like two megs. So for our stuff, which was all native and C++-driven, we were really dependent on the CPU behaving the way we wanted it to and being able to go through a certain number of cycles at a certain speed. So that was important to us. The second part is this guy on network IO. These are not guarantees in the cloud. If you're going to run out there, you better be able to sustain some sort of volatility. In the disk IO scenario, we ran some tests. We ran against an M600 blade, and we got 10 megabits of throughput to the disk all the time. No matter what we did, that's what we were getting. If we went through the cloud, we saw things like 1 megabit to 100 megabit, and just changing within seconds. And it really depended on how you set up your system, where your system was, and again, what version and generation of system you happen to be on, if Amazon happened to choose for you. So these are important things. They're not showstoppers. They're just things to know. They're things to watch out for. So the pros, you're not buying the farm. You're not spending $25 million in hardware before you know you have a paying customer. So we really need to take this alone and compare to that for the because you just don't spend all that money up front. Your company now has a chance to succeed. Most of the games that I've worked on were very, very, very successful. But, but there was a moment there where we were a little worried because we'd spent so much money on, on how that was going to work. Dynamic scaling. We can scale up and scale down without having to buy new hardware. There's no lead time to it. And so we don't have to worry about that months out where we have to do data center contracts and hire a guy to manage that. And of course, easy way to deploy new parts of the world. And this is actually really key for the industry that I came from. If you want to try your game in a new market, you don't need to go out and stand up a data center somewhere else to make sure that they can run there. You just stand up a few servers in Amazon, load up a small version of your game, point some people to it, and see how it goes. If it doesn't work out, you shut it down and move on. So it's a fantastic way of testing your game. And in fact, most games now, especially mobile games, are heading in that direction. So now we're going to get into some like more deep tech about some of the things that we did when we were running this way. We went from data centers to the cloud. But one of the first things we wanted to do and figure out was that we, provisioning was going to be a problem for us. We didn't, and I don't mean any events, we didn't run Chef or Puppet at the time in the data center. We used Paramico and Python and wrote very small siloed tools to do exactly what we needed to do. Don't recommend it. It's painful. Chef's a good tool. Uh, but with that being said, we had a very certain environment that we were trying to stand up. We relied very heavily on Red Hat and CentOS kickstarts. So these are what we used to provision our systems. Does anybody here run CentOS Red Hat? Anybody? One guy? Wow, that's telling. Uh, so obviously, nobody's using Kickstart is just literally a seed file. You throw it on there. When the installation starts, it reads the file. It installs everything you need. You don't need to do any aftermarket configuration. The moment your system boots, you're ready. So we had to devise a way to do that inside of Amazon. Amazon supports something called PBGrub. And that it basically allows you to boot the custom kernel on your VM. So what we did was we, were, we booted the net install image for CentOS. So what, what we did is we loaded the kernel in the memory, and then the first thing we did using this kickstart free section, which basically runs for anything else in the installation process does, and we blew away the partition data. Like, nope, don't care, I don't care what was here before, we're moving, moving. And then we installed on top of it. And by doing that, what we were allowed to do is use one single AMI. We didn't have to have more than a single AMI. And we'd be able to configure a system to do whatever we wanted. And the moment that system booted, it was ready. There was no waiting for an aftermarket piece to come in and deal with it. So for the specific case of the world systems we talked about earlier, that was fantastic. It wasn't a lot of system configuration we needed to do. We needed the system running, and we needed the binary running. That was it. So you can follow the process here. The other part of this is that we couldn't use Amazon scaling me mechanisms because it's based on web stuff. We needed our game to be able to make a decision about how many worlds it needed, how many players are playing. Because these are binary protocols. They are on straight TCP. And there was nothing. There were no load balancers in front, so we couldn't measure anything. So the game itself knew what it needed. And I recommend that to anybody who's developing a large application. Your application is the best thing in the world to decide how much resource you need. And Amazon provides a fantastic API for that. So we actually, the game says I need a new world process, sends a message over to our gateway process, which is written in Python. That, create, that got a create instance request. 
sent it over to the cloud, started up our seed image, the image I talked about before. That image booted up, and the first thing it did when it booted up was said, give me my Kickstarter file before I install. We dynamically created a configuration file based on what it is that needed to happen on that system. So what version of the world need to be running? What was the host name? What do you want the password to be? Everything you need about that system was about to be laid down. We dynamically created it, spit it back. The system began its build process, and about five minutes later, you would have a system up and running with the exact distribution that you want of all the packages you needed. It would then come back and say, I have to build my complete. And then we would go, OK, cool, start the world process. And the important part is this world ID. World ID. We actually got that back up here. It's, it gave us the world ID. We say start world with world ID. And then we, set, we tell the game, thank you very much. Your process should connect in momentarily. The world will start up and connect into the game. And so we had a fluid process for getting all these worlds to spin up and down with as few pieces in between us and the end result as possible. And that was really key for us. So back to the SQL and to not SQL a question. One of these up here may or may not have been the services that I used. Um, maybe or maybe not have been the service that we use here. Uh, MongoDB is fantastic. Couchbase, these are all great. There's a couple of pros and cons to note about them. They're all fast read and write. They're all distributed. That's fantastic. They are, tradition they are still new compared to things like Oracle and MySQL. Keep that in mind. They've only been around five, six, seven years in some cases. Amazon DynamoDB, fantastic, but it's REST only. Somewhere we decided that REST was the best protocol to do everything, and I don't know when that happened. But if you want really fast protocol, that, that may not be your answer. So the other part of this, relational DB, DB indexable data, MySQL, Cassandra, Oracle, Postgres, all of them fantastic options. If you ever find someone saying that either one of these is a religious war about which one is better, the reality is one is good for one use, the other is good for another use. Pick the one that is right for your application. Don't get stuck in this, which one should I use? Then? Pros, tri tried and true, can be distributed as well. It is built for structure, whereas these guys are not document storage. That's a pro and that's a con. On either side of this thing. Slow to write speed, and again, I put con, built for structure. Don't choose. Use both if you need to. It's fine. Nobody's going to be upset with you. That is it in the file. I'm happy to, I went through that as fast as possible. I'm not happy to answer any questions, comments, or whatever. Yeah? Yeah? What does Dimmy Cloud do? Uh, we'll talk about that after I'm done and talking, because I fit this his meeting and talk about it. Did you run across the issue? So, so you were using the, the C files for um, the Red Hat. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with things where you're not going to use the the Red Hat ship, so it knows you're not using stuff out of RHEL, um, EPEL, whatever, mm -hmm. um, getting that that in there, like, you know, because a lot of it's become a lot more stack specific versus OS specific. So we, we run our own repositories for, for all of our RPM packages. When we stood up all these environments, they installed from our repositories, primarily because we wanted to control the packages that were being installed in our live environment. Uh, well, from my experience, and this is not true across the board, from my experience, if you're running a large number of servers, 1,000, 2,000, 2,000, 4,000 servers, aiming at making sure that each one of those servers is as similar as possible is your number one priority. You can't have your admin waking up at 4 in the morning and calling you and going, I don't understand why this system is completely different than every other system, and now I've got to figure out what the problem is. Now you don't know if the problem is your application, or if it's the system it's on, or what. So we built our own repository that stored all of our packages and made sure we were very controlling of what went into that particular repository. That is not to say that devs did not submit RPM, by the way. Uh, we were just controlling of what went in there. So when we had to deal with things like Python packages that weren't in RPM, for example, we did either build our own RPM or we would use another mechanism installed using the wget and the postscript section. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Is, yeah. is, you know, and using Python is a good example. Of, you know, there's a really good chance for you know any reasonably you know, sizable number of Python packages that you're not going to want to use what came in the distro. Absolutely, and to, to the point about DevOps, it's not about breaking down side, like making two silos. Your operations guy and your dev guys need to work together, and part of what they need to work together on what is going to be in live. Uh, how you know if the dev guy wants to install a new library, they really should be communicating with the ops guy about what what that library is and and what the effects of running it in that environment are. And Python's a good example. We standardized on Python 2.7, and a developer came to us and said, well, I really want to use Python 3.0. We would have a good conversation about it. We would end up going back to 2.7 in some cases. 
And that's what we stuck with. So really, it was more about we maintain control of our environment by having good conversations, not by just saying this is what we're going to do. And so we were able to avoid a lot of those problems because we didn't need to install a lot of stimulus packages on our system, just what we needed to install. Do we need to talk to each other? Yeah, I know. It's crazy, right? We actually we have beers together. Fucking okay, crazy. Uh, no, we, we actually we, we sat right near them. And we were very, very close to the engineers. In fact, sort of a, a side thing that happened is it became like the engineers and the ops guys got really close. And the management didn't like that so much. Um, but it's whatever. So you know, there's a, there's a model of doing that. DevOps, to this point, does not mean you install any package in your environment and you let all of your development systems be whatever they want them to be. Part of running a good operations group or part of running a good DevOps group is having the foresight to make a decision about what your environment should and should not look like. And what it should not look like is packages installed all over the place that have nothing to do with each other. Because that is going to lead you to a world of hurt. So the, in the, at the end of the day, it's about having a conversation with the engineers about what the environment should look like. Now, from, from what you sh showed us, but, but what if you like if you were doing an MMO today? Would you use a, like would you use like tools like uh, to set up a service? Would you use like tools like Chef to put put up a uh, put up a thousand like servers sure. and Jenkins to build servers? How would you like? How would somebody like build a social game or, or, or something or, like you have like three or four people? You're trying to put up a, a game. How would you put it up today? So we probably actually follow a similar model. Um, oftentimes we we did use later, uh, especially in Austin, we used a lot of Puppet and, and Chef actually as well. And it's, it has a place and a very very strong place. For us, it wasn't provisioning. It was for configuration management and for managing the systems after they were built. Um, it, you know, they, they do provisioning very, very well, but we would probably still go the path that we went in terms of trying to reduce the amount of resistance between us and getting our product running. So would you have just like some like servers that are like in the cloud and then, then some that are dedicated servers? Uh, I, you know, that's a personal opinion. I think that it really depends on your product. For us, for what I believe, I think that some products that have really, really strong disk I.O. concerns should consider something like that. Uh, Amazon and cloud-based solutions today are working towards better disk I.O. But again, it comes down to no guarantees. If you need to be able to scale your product and you need to know what it looks like in, you know, after you've hit 100,000 users or something like that, and you need to be able to engineer to that point, um, cloud-based systems, they're virtualized. And virtualization is not system mitosis. It is still the same system you're sharing with 10 other people. And in order to get better disk storage, you use network attack storage. So if you hear people say, I've got a thousand SSD systems or a thousand SSD drives, it's still network attached. So at the end of the day, you're still going to be sending your data across the network to be written bits. Um, in Amazon's case, and I don't know this for a fact, I think they use UDP as their backend sending. It gets sketchy at the end of the day. So if you need a database system that you need to have high I.O., I would still recommend running on hardware. If you have a bunch of systems, you don't care where they are, and if they fall over, or what they're going to do, and if they don't underwrite the disk, run them in the cloud. It's fantastically scalable. If you have like, if you have like five, six hundred, or over a thousand, and like dedicated servers, do you use like Chef or Puppet to do their configuration? Yeah. So it depends on how your environment set up. You can use, absolutely. Chef and Puppet is fantastic for configuration <coughs> management on a system, especially on a thousand servers. Um, we used a lot of a time, and Chef wasn't quite as mature as it is today, back about five years ago, but it was, we used Python and Paramico a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Paramico is an SSH implementation for Python, so you just go into the systems. We had a lot of homegrown scripts to do that. Sometimes you have to make a decision about whether or not you want to buy the whole wheel, or if you really just want a spoke of that wheel. And if you just want the spoke, I'm going to encourage you to write a homegrown system. If you want to actually uh, manage a thousand systems, and you want Chef to be your tool, don't just sort of commit, like commit, like use that tool, and don't duct tape the other 10 open source solutions because one of them is going to fail. And when, you, when that happens, you're going to be stuck trying to figure out why. And you know, the reality is if you've got 450,000 people who are not playing your game right now because that open source software failed because you have 10 of them in a row, that's not a good position to be in. I guess with that and service that, let's say, are like the legacy system like Solaris, would you use something like VMware to like, like manage? I have no idea. I'm not familiar with Solaris in any way, shape, or form. Okay. But other than, other than I saw hardware in Rackwonder. Okay. <laughs> it says you ran out of 
um, your processes were single threaded? Did you just run a lot of processes on them? So with what we were doing and the type of manipulation that we were doing to the data, single threaded C based processes worked just fine for us. Depends on what you're doing. Uh, these processes, like a world process, to give you an idea of the general math that was going through was I cast a spell on <laughs> Nathan over there. I've now got to calculate if that spell can affect him. If he's got any buffs, oh, by the way, he's staying next to somebody else who has a buff that might affect him, that might affect me, and we've got to calculate that's called like skill trees and that kind of stuff. For C, handling lists that way is fantastic. It does it really, really, really fast. If you try to thread that process, you're going to end up fighting it more than you are not. So yeah, we just made more world processes scale sort of horizontally than we were fighting threads. That's not our network library was threaded. But, but I guess sort of like what's happened now, because now for the most, I guess, the servers are multi-threaded, so. Uh, it, threading is hard, and the engineer tells you otherwise. I don't know what to say. It's really hard um, to do right. You can thread lots of things. Python has threading, but it's not really threading. Oh, so you just do it like single thread. Hmm? Okay. You said you um, you pointed out the pros and cons of the cloud compared to sure. dedicated servers. Do you ever start to mix sometimes? Absolutely. Uh, and yeah. you run into issues because of it? So we run for our service. Location. For our service, we run um, some of our systems in Rackspace and some of our systems in Amazon. Um, I think that if you had asked me that question two years ago, I would have said there is a big concern there. Be hesitant. Um, though cloud markets are still pretty immature, they have come a long ways. Uh, connecting, connection between data center and data center in this world, it's getting faster and faster all the time. I mean, when I was younger, one of the games on there was Ultima Online. Getting a 300 millisecond ping to that game was rock solid. So these days, it's not as much of a concern. Rackspace has a data center in Chicago. Amazon's got one in the East Coast. You're talking about 40 to 30 second millisecond latency. The connections are usually pretty solid. We ran a MySQL slave in DC, or master in DC, and a slave in Australia. And it wasn't great, but it functioned. Don't undo that, by the way. It's a bad idea, but it worked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, guys.